The following program was made by a volunteer producer. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of MCM Productions. Cagney and Lacey, they canceled it three times. I mean, it's a wonder they didn't try and kill him with a stick. What is their problem? Because we gotta seem in charge. We gotta seem like we can handle everything ourselves. Like a normal family, or else they have an excuse to split us up. Well, again, not if we're working together. Now, what makes you think that I would want to work with you? I want to be your friend. Christy Huddleston, who are you? I wish I knew. She black girl just gave you a Cheyenne name. Medicine woman. tonight, Barbara. Would you like to introduce them and let yes, our audience get to know them? It's an honor to introduce them. We're here with the two founding members of the band Plastic Land, Glenn Racy and John Frankovic. Welcome. Thank you for well, thank having you. us. Thank you. Well, as I said, it is an honor to have you both here. Not only did you win the Whammy Hall of Fame, one of the Whammy Hall of Fame awards this year, but you have such a long history in local music and beyond. How do we begin? Yeah. Well, are you two local? Are yeah. Local yeah. We, we actually, our, our music career together started when we were kids. Uh, we had a band called the New Ghouls. And <laughs> Which we, was a follow-up from something I started with my cousin, and he had lost interest in writing music and such, so John decided to team up with me, and, and we just continued to do more and more projects down the road. However, there were breaks in between oh, yeah, with absolutely. other projects where we worked with different people, but finally, you know, we both became focused more on what we were going to do, and it was in the same room, so we thought, let's go with this. Yep. And our, our interests developed together, too, as we'd go out and uh, scar the record stores. We um, couldn't take home everything we wanted, but we could split the load between us and, well, and, that's exactly and borrow what, each other's that, records. And that's so. exactly what we did. <laughs> right. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, 1812 Overshore, Radio Doctors. Remember all those places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anywhere where they had imported records. <laughs> Wonderful. And about yes. when would that have been now? Take us back to about what year was this sort of formulating? I think the you... first time that we started making noise together was about 1966 because wow. I remember yeah. we were were doing Gloria and the Shadows and Night had the hit with it instead sure. of the band that actually um, came up with it which was Van Morrison and, 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 and that would have been Glenn on auto harp 
and myself on drums. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> and John did So the creativity goes thing. way back. And I had, yeah. had uh, been schooled on piano by a local m musician named Milton Miritz, and I wasn't a very good student at the time. <laughs> I really wanted to, to do rock and roll, and I was interested in guitar and sort of became self-taught on that. John played trombone as his instrument. Oh. And, mm -hmm. uh, as far as formal training goes, yeah. Uh -huh. But um, we basically started out in the garage as a garage group, and uh, eventually things changed, and we went through our own musical experiences. And by the time it was, I was uh, maybe 17 and John was uh, 14, we hooked back up together for... Wow, that young you guys are when you started, right. huh? Well, wow. you know, we grew up together. We yeah. lived so you were about neighbors or yeah. across the street okay. around yeah. the okay, corner, neighbor. so wow. less than two houses away. Yeah, if you cut through the neighbor's backyard, it was across the street. Across the street, <laughs> right? Well, so you've been together for quite a while, then. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so did you? How'd you get your start as far as uh, you know getting where you are now? I mean. Pretty impressive. Or the evolution of yeah. Plastic Land. How did you get to that well, point? Plastic Land was a preconceived concept artistically of what we wanted to accomplish as a certain genre of uh, music from a certain time period that we were very interested in not exploiting but really bringing it back out into the public eye. And so, you know, we started off with a, a solid concept. All short songs for the band that we had before, Plastic Land, Rousing Polaris, all the songs, uh, they were pieces. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were very long. Mm -hmm.
It was a post art rock thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was not uncommon for groups like Yes and Pink Floyd to take up an entire side of an LP with one song. Um, I think the first group that really did something like that and had success with it was in Agata De Vida by the Iron Butterfly. And you, it really is a wonderful piece of music, but it, it was too long and you had this lengthy drum solo and there were good things to it, but what it did is it uh, gave people an idea of it not having to strip down to a top 40 format. And Iron Butterfly did do an edited version of the song that was about two and a half minutes long to launch sure. at, at uh, AM radio at the time. But psychedelic music and garage rock was, was something that was handled with kid gloves in the Midwest and particularly in Milwaukee. And a lot of the stuff that was getting aired in other areas of the country and other parts of the world was not happening in this town. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that broke th that cycle for me was my dad's Helicrafters shortwave radio band in the basement. Mm -hmm. And I would listen to German stations in a station out of Boston. And I was able to hear the groups that I wanted to hear that weren't getting airplay in Milwaukee. And one of the main ones was the band The Pretty Things which was a, a British band that is still together to this day. Mm -hmm. And it is somewhat of a, um, an outgrowth from a formative version of the Stones with uh, Mick and Keith and guitarist Dick Taylor, who was a year younger than them and decided to quit working with the Stones to form his own group with a friend of his named Phil May. Right and right. they're still together. But there were lots of other groups too that we found were not getting the airplay and the exposure that we felt well, you they know, and, deserved. And that helped us kind of formulate an opinion about the Milwaukee market. So we made a conscious decision that we weren't gonna worry about Milwaukee. We were going to put out our own self-released records, which, be, which really was a, a kind of, the, there was a revolution of bands doing that that we weren't even aware of until we started getting into that whole revolution of self-released uh, you know, records, you know, in 45s. Mm -hmm. And Glenn and I, we would drive down to Chicago, we'd drive up to Minneapolis, fly to San Francisco, fly to, to New York. Madison. Uh, the time that we flew to London with a, two suitcases full of plastic land 45s, and then eventually we, we thought we were just gonna you know, peddle them in record stores, but all of a sudden rough trade distribution who was huge you know at that time they, this guy named Gareth this Irish punk who was just the coolest guy he just loved it and he, he, he bought the whole lot Wow! <laughs> and hence we discovered distributors yeah. and then oh, we just okay. started selling to distributors after that so really kind of just going beyond the Milwaukee market mm -hmm. not ignoring it but making sure our emphasis really went to you know London, Paris, New York. Our special guest stars, the Plastic Land is here today. They're from Milwaukee. They have two brand new 45s out. They've just completed a, a tour of the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. And this, uh, gentlemen, this is the last stop, the Uncle Floyd show? That's correct. Uh, well, we'll be heading back to Milwaukee and yeah. doing Midwest dates. Okay. Big hand for Plastic Land right here. <laughs>
San Francisco. And I think it would be safe to say that um, we came back with twice the weight of records that we went over with because we were out looking for rarities and, and interesting groups mm -hmm. from the late 60s that we weren't able to find in record stores here. Plus now we had a whole smoke, empty the suitcase. creation, the action. <laughs> yeah, right. there were just yeah. Droves of, of incredible bands that were not getting any publicity in the U.S. or they, they might get their picture in 16 Magazine or Tiger Beat once and that would be it because they would only go as far as launching 145 and you know, the, they already had their winners picked out. It was going to be the Stones, the Raiders, the Beatles. You know, there was a lot of uh, politics in what was going to be a successful well, record it, it at that It was very time. interesting. When we signed with Enigma Records, the owner told us right out, he says, we simply don't have enough money to bribe all the DJs that would need to be bribed in <laughs> order to get you guys, a, you know, a top 40 hit. And, yeah. and he was the gentleman that got us involved with Enigma Records, his name was Steve Pross, and he was working for Dutch East India Trading at the time, and John had become acquainted as a phone friend with him, mm -hmm. and when he got his job as an A&R man for Enigma, yeah. he said, we're going to sign Plastic yeah. Room. Steve, right. Steve calls so. me up and he says, John, I got a job, A&R department for Enigma Records. I says, oh, you hit the big time, congratulations. Yeah. And he goes, I'm bringing you with me. That is wonderful. <laughs> so about what year was that? The uh, 84. Deal? Um, that sounds and about 84. right. About 84. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. how many records did you put on under that label? Um, they actually, they re released uh, a French album that we had put out on Lolita Records, or Lolita Records put out for us. Um, they re-released that with a couple of different songs and then we recorded for the label two additional albums. And what happened is John... No one needs whiskey to sing the blues. And that's his next number from this line album. It's called House. And what happened is John was, you know, 
trying to pedal our music to different places and uh, he had sent a copy out to a gentleman named Greg Shaw who um, was a writer and started up Fox Records and he suggested to John that uh, he take a trip to France because the French labels, the Indies were signing new groups mm -hmm. and they were particularly interested in mod and psychedelic style bands. Oh, and I, I went over there with 20 promo packs. And about 20 words in French. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, and wow. by the time I, and, and I had been looking for Lolita Records, or Ava Records, actually is a parent mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. I had been looking for them and looking for them because I knew they were a prime candidate for us. And I had burned through all my other promo packs without any luck. And all I had was one left. And I was in a record store and I was saying, I can't find this Ava Records. And the guy goes, well, did you look at the back of one of their records? And sure enough, I looked at the back and there was the address, so I looked it up and I, I walked in their office, um, sat down, and uh, there was Jacques and Jean-Marc, and Jean-Marc spoke English, Jacques didn't, but Jacques was, he was kind of the guy calling the shots, and I put on, I believe it was Euphoric Tractor Shoes, and this Jacques looks at Jean-Marc, he goes, sign them. <laughs> well, good choice to put that one on. Great. Yeah, and then the Enigma thing happened after that. But it was also interesting because once we got signed to the French label, that's when the Milwaukee and Madison audiences, which we didn't draw very well in Milwaukee or Madison, all of a sudden they started, people com started coming out because they heard that we had some success overseas. Right. Yeah. And a lot of times I think that's the case. A lot of entertainers and they see nothing in their hometown, but you really have to go somewhere else and prove that your talent is worth sure. investing and, and listening to. Yes, we see and, that a um, lot. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, needless to say, if Joan Crawford would have stayed home, she never would have been a famous <laughs> movie star, you know? <laughs> you have to go to the right places where the yeah. industry is. Well, and that's the whole thing. And that's in the States, it's San Francisco, LA, New York. 
and then the other peripheral cities on, on the coast. And then, of course, Minneapolis has got a vibrant music scene. Mm -hmm. you know, and Chicago did, too. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there was uh, Chess Records and, and uh, Dunwich was down there and uh, Mercury, you know, which was the parent group with uh, Phillips and uh, Smash Records, which had signed the Walker Brothers and... Uh, Left Bank and some of the other groups that were a little more inventive than your average ones. And of course, one of my favorite artists, Dusty Springfield, yeah. who was a huge influence on me as a singer. Yeah. So Chicago had a lot going on for it for different periods of time, but it was on and off. And then they kind of got stuck in, in the horn band thing because of the success of Chicago. This is one of my favorites. I thought about it a great deal. And I've always considered repeating songs in an evening a bit of a self-indulgence. I've never denied what I am. Tradition, tradition, because I had lessons to drink shit to the high school dance. Paid off a school ball to hire this bee. Give me a substation to medical schemes. We ate up nine months like a nature played on me. Just to give injections while they twitch and dare. No matter what they say, there's nothing worse than the monster known as the high school nurse. Atrocities of a lifetime, that is one of me. You should smoke with a grease, I'm stuck out, but you with a medical degree. On the wall of the river, I do sleep. Beware of danger, the trouble of breast. We do talk to the boy, torture test. The blue scene was always thriving there, but one of the things that happened was uh, they decided to start signing British groups to their label, and uh, because the British bands were reflecting an appreciation of the genre that white-run record companies in the United States weren't going to touch this stuff. And so it was a major breakthrough. I mean, people would, would go out and buy a Pat Boone record of him covering Little Richard, but they would not allow an air Little Richard himself in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all of a sudden, here's the Beatles, and, the, and you know, they're covering Long Tall Sally and 
a lot of other tracks and the other thing was uh, you had Motown records and the entire black music scene just it, it, it just flowered and blossomed and grew and, and finally you had a little bit more in in the pop area and and you know some was more dance oriented and you know Barry Gordy and and the people that were involved with the Detroit scene really were visionary and they saw a lot of success abroad when they weren't being received particularly as well in the U.S. <laughs> changed yeah. though yeah. In, a, in a five year stretch it was amazing how things progressed with bands like the pretty things and the stones you know they were fans of Bo Diddley and Chuck Berry and with the stones at least and uh, as a matter of fact pretty things even took their name from the, the song of the same title by Bo Diddley but um, they weren't really launching the Pretty Things stateside, and they sent them to Australia, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of the market was missed, and they were eventually sound to, signed to Motown Records when Rare Earth became the subsidiary that was going to handle putting out white music from Britain, and some from the States. The band itself, Rare Earth, was out of that area, and they were terrific. And they did have many hit records, but uh, besides the pretty things doing their, their rock opera um, and their follow-up parachute, they, they had signed um, Dave Edmonds' group at the time, Love Sculpture, and it was another exceptional group, and they only did one album with them. One of the problems was is they were a little bit slow with releasing those items and it was just one of the, the problems that was happening and, and uh, we're facing that right at this point in time too with a delay on some of our stuff coming back out in the UK 
and uh, we've been working with Cherry Red, and they did do the first album last year, but uh, we need to have more communication with them to see what has been holding up the show, and they've had the materials now for close to a year, and... Uh, and you know, this kind of stuff is typical. I mean, it it's, is, it's just yeah. it's just typical. just how the industry is, yeah. and uh, you know, not everybody um, is going to be the first priority. And certainly mm -hmm. was the case with us being signed to Enigma Records too, to their subsidiary, Pink Dust, and uh, we did quite well with it. And saw some of our competitors that John and I saw in England, uh, say like the the Prisoners and the Milkshakes, and a lot of these. Groups uh, were dropped by the label when it changed hands and suddenly was being run by some other people. Mm -hmm. They did keep us on for three LPs, but they never did the fourth one. But we were picked up by a German label. And uh, unfortunately, our material got lost in the mail, our, our master oh, yeah. tapes and our cover art. And so there was a big delay with it. And um, it, it was most disappointing for us, but it's Once life. again, the nature you know? of the business. Right. The business. You know, and, and also, you know, when we were talking about the Chicago scene, I, I think there are certain other individuals that really helped Plastic Land out considerably, like Jim McNamara. Mm -hmm. This this guy, um, uh, he, he died of heroin abuse, unfortunately. He was brilliant. And he literally introduced ska and reggae music to the Chicago market and punk rock to the Chicago market. And he took us under his wing. And he had a nightclub called Tuts at the time. And mm -hmm. he would give us really nice time slots. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and opportunities we wouldn't have had. Right. Eventually, we could solicit other places, like Misfits was one. And, and Tuts became the Avalon. And, there were a few other clubs, too, that we played down there, and we did end up playing with some friends of ours, the Rain Parade at the Vic Theater, which was a big event, and it, and it was very nice. And mm -hmm. uh, they gave us accommodations and had a turkey dinner for us. And <laughs> it was Things wonderful. you remember. Got to have that food. Right. right. <laughs> Got to have that food. That was always in our contract, Ryder. <laughs> so. One really nice meal. And I couldn't drink beer because I would... I, I, it's too Herb. gassy. It's so too gassy. I, I had to get <laughs> vodka or gin. Her, oh. her, I, I was good with a bottle of bourbon or, or scotch. Well, that, that, that was in our rider as well. Yeah. Dinner, mm -hmm. one bottle of vodka, one bottle of gin or whatever. So I... This next number that we're going to do is going to be done in commemoration of the Summer of Love because this is its 10th anniversary. song called Mink Dress. around down every street in town everyone's head turns my way
double as a pink dress Gonna go and find a mink dress Mink dress Oh I had another question about the cherry red label, and um, now your hopes for that currently are as far as uh, did they promise you a series of releases that are um, hopefully well they signed in the up works? For, excuse me for interrupting, Barb. Uh, what happened is they had some changes in the staff there, and we were notified that there is a delay with uh, sending any money out because there was confusion in that regard and, and things were being changed just, I suppose, the way that they were when we were with Enigma Pink Dust. Oh, yeah. And, and people yeah, change, the other things labels. change. Mm -hmm. yeah. And different people get jobs and they're enthused about certain bands and suddenly, you know, they're, they're forgetting that they had signed for this and um, they had sent us in advance, which allowed us to, to have our music remastered, so we had a little better fidelity and, and uh, could tweak out some of the uh, abrupt things that might have been happening with it. So um, we are waiting to see what is going to be happening with this. So like stay and, tuned uh, for your fans out there, people that are going to be watching this. Stay right. tuned. They've There's got the album cover artwork which Glenn and Leroy worked on together, which mm -hmm. is, I've seen it, and it's spectacular. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've got everything they need. Yeah. So it's just a matter of them and the one thing putting it out. And one thing very nice yeah. about it is they were going to include all of the odd tracks that were B-sides of 45s and, and separate releases before the album came out. Mm -hmm. And so all the stuff from that time period when we were on Repulsion Records in Germany was being packaged together and that never had been released in the U.S. and so for us this was an exciting thing because it actually was going to offer a chance for more people to pick up on what was a hard to find record in sure. certain places. Sure. And mm -hmm. it still will. It's and they're happen. expensive to try to yeah. go out tracking down some of our stuff. It's, yeah. it's mm -hmm. shot up in collector's price but... Um, well the first couple of sync 45s that we put out are just through the roof as far as what people are willing to pay for. Yeah, yeah. watch eBay. <laughs> um, and then I just want to ask each of you, um, currently as far as music goes, what are either of you involved in any other projects or just kind of laying low on the music scene or? I'm, I'm kind of laying low, I'm not doing much of anything. Uh -huh. And unfortunately I have to say the same and to add on it's somewhat due to health restrictions that uh, started to uh, hit us at our age. None of us are getting any younger. Right. That's yep. just a fact. No, it's supposed to be better. <laughs> yeah, they keep telling us and it's supposed to be better. And in some ways it really <laughs> well, is. In some but ways, but the physical part of it is what screws right. it up. Right, I don't you know? mind the numbers. It's the aches and the pains and exactly. the stiffness. And yep. I certainly mm. can't yep. move as adeptly on a keyboard or on guitar as I once could. I've yeah. got arthritis and that's no. all Well, you fooled us it. at the Whammy Award show, I have to tell you, because that'll be included in but the But I copped show. out because I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't practiced on any mm -hmm. instrument and it was the first performance I had done in five years and I didn't really have enough time to to get my equipment thing together, but there was, a, you know, a grouping of songs that I only did vocals on, and we focused on that yeah. uh, so that we could get the show together. <laughs> but uh, this was from Wonder, Wonderful Wonderland.
special event that it was, and I'm sorry that John was not able to do it, but he had just had surgery a short time before. Right, but we're so and glad you're here this evening to be part yeah. of this yeah, interview. Me it's, too, me too, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah and I want to Appreciate thank you very it. much. So. This has been very interesting. Thank you. Unfortunately, our time, I mean, we're almost restricted with time. I'm sure we could have talked probably another half hour. We could. Well, maybe but, yeah. part two will be yeah. forthcoming. Who knows? When the, maybe you can come back. When the new album us. comes out, we'll have <laughs> yeah, you back. Yeah, we'll and not new album, the re. Yeah. Well, there is a new album. Yeah. Besides, they're, they're signing up to reissue a compilation that came out that uh, a, a Greek gentleman that had moved to the Chicago area put together a label and he wanted to round up some of our rarities and obscure recordings and put out a compilation that packaged them for the public. And it's been 20 years since that's happened. And so this British label was interested in it. They are listed. On, on the contract, the songs that they have the right to use and, and package. But we wanted to keep things in individual packaging pertinent to the time periods. And then uh, lastly would be the recordings that were done in 2006 and some other songs that were documented a few years ago now that were the last phases of the band and the last songs that I had written with Leroy Booth for the project. And uh, okay. so we got it together and, and got the songs recorded. Um, their history, if they come out tomorrow, their history, they were history at the time <laughs> that they were documented. Sure. And we had not played or done anything for a few years there. But, you know, We'll have to see how our, our health holds up and our enthusiasm and, and what kind of uh, press we're getting. And, mm -hmm. and we have had good press for the first album once again. Mm -hmm. And we'll see what, what goes on and, and if we can hobble up with our walkers. <laughs> 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 okay, and um, fans out there, if they want to sort of keep updated, you have a Facebook page, is that correct? Someone, uh, there's a Plastic Land Facebook page. Someone that page. Uh, hooked us up with Cherry Red Records, a gentleman named Robert Shad, who is an artist in the New York area, mm -hmm. put one together, and there is also okay. a, some stuff on, on a website that we were And that Leroy address and is? Attempted. Plasticland.com or? Um, well, there's several. Oh, and okay. And I don't have a computer, so it's not right on the tip of my tongue. Okay, well, Google it. <laughs> that's yeah, it. That's, that's, that's the best thing to do is for us out one, there. One we more are out Plastic there. Land, yeah. yeah. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. And okay. thank you again for yeah. having me. Thank you, thank you. No problem. It's been a pleasure, and it's been very interesting to hear you two fellas talk. It's, uh, you know, really takes you back on things and uh, mm -hmm. history and that, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, and look forward to your, what was it, with its CD style, is that how it's going to come out? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And we <laughs> you never were, know nowadays, because now they're going back to final. some of those. Right. So all my royalty statements are downloads now. Yeah. Every, every last <laughs> one of them. Well, we were going to try to encourage Cherry Red to do vinyl on the new recordings, and if they don't, we'll see how they feel about uh, are doing it ourselves maybe or mm. finding someone else to do that uh, modality of listening mm -hmm. because it's the best yeah definitely well we'll be looking okay. for it so you go blind just <laughs> trying to read the liner notes on a cd not only do i have to wear glasses to see it but i have to use a magnifying Magnify glass <laughs> oh, i'm glad of, to hear somebody else say that. it's tired isn't yeah. it <laughs> I'll tell you. Well, okay. thank you again for having us. Okay, okay thank, thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay.
Volunteer producer through MCM, a nonprofit organization.